Welcome everyone to Transformational Leadership, part of the Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series. Today's webinar is offered in valued partnership with the Arizona Technology Council and Tech United NJ. The Rutgers Business School Signature Leadership Series is a relatively new learning opportunity that brings you lessons of resilience, resourcefulness, responsibility, and reinvention through bi-weekly conversations with thought leaders and business leaders from across industry spectrums. I have the pleasure today of introducing uh, Blake Irving, who serves on the board of directors of Autodesk, DocuSign, FlowHub, ZipRecruiter, and McLaren Formula One team. He served as CEO of GoDaddy from 2013 to 2018, where he drove growth and operations and reshaped the domain, domain name um, into the world's largest platform for small business. Under his leadership, the company was voted by the Anita Borg Foundation as one of the top 12 companies in the world to work if you were a woman engineer. He's had a very impressive career that you'll get to hear a lot more about today um, during the presentation. Here to help us get to know um, Blake a little bit better is Steve Ziltra, the current president and chief executive officer at the Arizona Technology Council, a role held since 2007. His impressive career began at Ford Motor Company. He's held roles as an engineer in technology management and business development and as an executive. Steve's education includes a bachelor's degree from Western Michigan University, graduate studies at Cal State Fullerton, and a doctorate from the University of Advancing Technology. The Arizona Technology Council has been a great partner in promoting our signature leadership series. So Steve, we thank you for that, and I'm gonna let you take it from here. Very good, it's uh, great to be here. Can you hear me? We can, yes, thank you. Very good, very good. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and especially to uh, moderate this session with uh, Blake Irving, who I got to know when he was in Arizona running GoDaddy. And uh, I've interviewed him before and we've had some provocative discussions and uh, I look forward to uh, today's um, discussion. So Blake, you've been in the technology industry, I think since the 80s. Um, yes, you're old like me and uh, always seem to be doing things that are sort of converse to uh, con conventional wisdom. Why do you think that is? And uh, what's different about you than other leaders of your era? Well, wait, before I address that, I just wanna add uh, one more R to the four R's, which is respiration. Uh, so I thought I'd just you know, share the same experience everybody else is going through with a, uh, with an opening with my mask on since every moment outside of the house seems to be this, but I will take it off just to be a little more clear. Um, and thanks, good to see you, Steve, buddy, out on that uh, webcam universe. Um, it's a good question, it's interesting. So um, I think most of the folks that are in the technology industry tend to come from engineering backgrounds. Um, even sometimes their parents or their families were engineers or they grew up with something like that. I grew up in a, in a sort of a weird situation where my father was um, a child movie star in Hollywood then became a jazz musician. My mother was a jazz musician. They met on a bandstand. Uh, I was raised around music. I became a musician uh, and was a drummer and a drummer even uh, professionally in the LA area for you know decades. And uh, actually decided that I didn't want to pursue music in college because I was like, you know, I, I, I just thought it would kind of ruin my experience in music to make it a, a study. So I picked up something else that I was always interested in, which was art. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with my dad. He's going like, wow, that art degree, that's real value. <laughs> you know, pregnant pause. And he was in a, at this point in his career after, you know, he was a head of the FBI for Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. Uh, for a while, and then became a uh, became a, an attorney. As my grandfather was a city attorney at Glendale, California, and he's like, "Really? Are you going to be an art major? That's great. Well, that will that uh, that that degree will be enhanced with a mahogany frame, basically." 
<laughs> and so <clears throat> I just said, look, I, I'm really passionate about this. <clears throat> I think I can do a good job at it. And so, and it's similar to it's similar to music, but I think there's a side of it that becomes technical too. And so I actually got into typography um, in the late 70s, 79, 80. And I, oddly, that that uh, art degree and that typography uh, uh, work led me to my first tech job. And I was in a classroom, uh, and Xerox, who you remember is a copier company, actually did the first laser printers and workstations back in the 80s. They did a portfolio review in my classroom. They were pretty close by to my college and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in going to check out their uh, facility because they liked my portfolio. They thought maybe there was a match, but I'd be interested. I said, yeah, sure, why not? I'll give it a shot. You know, this sounds like it'd be a fun thing. And, you know, I was kind of out there and exposing myself. And I walked in to this computer lab with, you know, WYSIWYG workstations like we have today. Like it was like looking at a bunch of Macs. They were on Xerox Altos back in the day, which were 512 megabyte. That was a lot of memory back then, you know, removable hard drives and people were actually editing and creating uh, typography for laser printers um, in, the, in the shop. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? Sat down at one of the workstations. I had a three button mouse and a keyboard. Remember this is 1980. I'm on the internet. Um, you know, I have a printer 300 feet away from me that's printing out anything I want. Uh, and I could sit there and, you know, communicate with other people via email and chat. And I was like, this is amazing. So I ended up taking the job and just got into the art of computers and the way the computers actually function and all of this stuff that I was just so fortunate to get a, a, a look at back, back in the day. And Nobody even believed the stuff that I was doing was possible. I'd, I'd show up doing, you know, and I was going to college at the same time. So I was getting my undergrad degree. And I think a lot of people at Rutgers do this uh, same thing. I was working uh, full time at Xerox. I was getting, you know, nine to 12 units outside of the office. And I'd take back, you know, um, reports that I had done in the office using that same equipment. And people would go like, was this typeset? How did you do this? This is insane. And I'd say, yeah, no, I just did it at, at, at work. And so it was interesting. That experience, after spending, I spent seven years there, got my master's degree, my undergrad degree while I was there, and uh, my master's in business at Pepperdine. And one of the things that Xerox encouraged me to do while I was getting my master's, I said, hey, you know, you ought to uh, think about, you know, writing some business plans and taking your degree and seeing if you can do something, do something with it. And so I wrote a, I wrote a business plan on all the stuff that I was doing in that lab to create a piece of software that would allow other remote labs to do the same thing and eventually people to do the same. And so um, wrote that up, Xerox funded it. I actually got to go create these little labs around the world that would do typography logos for workstations and laser printers and stuff. And uh, it was kind of like off to the races. Nobody had thought about doing it before. It didn't make sense really. I had to fight a bunch of people inside the company that thought it was a stupid idea, which I inevitably got uh, used to. Um, and <laughs> so it was like, okay, well, I'll, I'm, you know, I got, got my master's degree. I had just won the Chairman's Award for Innovation for this program at Xerox. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna bail out. You know, they always say, take advantage when your stock is high. And I was being recruited pretty heavily. And so I bailed uh, out. I ended up at a compact uh, computer where I got to do it again. And, and uh, I got to call on some of the things that I had done in music and, and actually put the first audio, uh, the first audio and, and video or audio chip, a 16 bit A to D, D to A converter into a PC. And while I was there, I met some guys um, from Microsoft who were working on um, speech recognition. And they wanted to use my PC as the ultimate speech recognition machine. And I started hanging out with these guys. It was like, I love these guys. This company is amazing. These people show up to, you know, Compaq was a very, it was a Texas-based company. I was wearing a suit every day, which is so not me. And <laughs> I showed up, I showed up on campus wearing t-shirts and shorts, you know, and they showed up in like June and it was 85 degrees and humid. I'm like, these guys are me. This is exactly what I would want to do. Uh, eventually um, got recruited uh, to Microsoft and they asked me to do the same stuff. 
So I wrote a, I, I kept writing papers about things that didn't necessarily make sense, but would follow a trend. So we talked about turning a PC into a telephone because we had A to D, D to A conversion. We needed a little extra uh, horsepower. So we added DSP capability. Uh, I built a piece of software called NetMeeting, which allowed you to share applications over the internet, which really wasn't big time yet. And we did it for corporations. Uh, it allowed you to share apps in real time. And then uh, I added audio to that after being told, well, it's a funny story. It went to AT&T, uh, the program manager of, the, of this program that was application sharing over the over a uh, IP connection. And we went to AT&T because they were very interested in the product. <clears throat> we sat in a meeting room in a you know beautiful mahogany covered uh, conference room from a guy named Waring Partridge. That was the senior exec. And uh, Waring told us when we got there, he goes, well, I know you probably thought we would have licensed your software. We don't. We just want to understand what you're doing with audio. And they were deathly afraid that Microsoft was going to do something with audio over the internet. We didn't have any plans to do it. None. We had some guys that were playing with it, but we didn't have a roadmap that said we were going to add it to the product. And they asked questions for an hour about this. And so Adam Rauch, the program manager on the team, and I left the meeting to fly back to Seattle. And on our way to the airport in New Jersey, um, we look at each other and go like, ah, that was weird. You know what we're going to do when we get back? No. <laughs> we're going to add audio to this thing because these guys are so deathly afraid of it. It must be the right thing to do, and they're expecting it. So within a month, we actually had audio. This, this talks about how fast. Uh, companies moved, you know, with software companies versus the telephone company. In a month, literally, we had audio in the product, uh, had started to release it, started releasing updates and, you know, iterating pretty quickly. Uh, released that. We were having trouble connecting people together. So we built the thing called MSN Messenger, which was a which was a, an instant messaging product. I patented something called Typing Indicator. Uh, so I was named on this thing, which is a uh, if you know your iPhone today and you can see when somebody's typing to you. Uh, so we patented that in 1997 or 98. Uh, and you could actually see when somebody was typing. It was like, wow, miracle. You can tell. So you don't cross chat somebody and you're saying the same thing at the same time. Uh, we added video to it uh, and then did, did a whole bunch of stuff that was all internet based because we thought you know, the app packaged application business was going to be dead. And, you know, over the course of my career, which is 15 years at Microsoft, I just kept doing that stuff and ended up running all the all the SaaS back end stuff for the company. Uh, and repeatedly, I got told the same thing I was told at Xerox. That is just, I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's stupid. Why would you do it? And I remember being in a lot of meetings with Bill uh, Gates and Steve Ballmer, where they would you know, honestly, they're pretty scary guys. They're so smart and they're, you know, pretty powerful running a big, big company that's growing like crazy. And they'd tell you you were stupid and that, and you'd have to actually go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I haven't explained it well enough. Let me say it slowly this time. And I think you'll get it. And so you'd end up having these contentious uh, conversations and arguments with some super scary people. That was um, really, I thought, and, and you know, the other thing, they, they wouldn't give you resources. You had to figure out how to go get it started on your own, just like you were doing a startup in the day. You know, if you're really committed to it, you'll figure out how to do it. And so I think, you know, from, a, from the four R's perspective, I, I think about, you know, reinvention of old software stuff, because we were trying to do stuff that didn't have anything to do with packaged software. And that was what the world was back then. And we were uh, building everything uh, for the internet, which, you know, when we started, didn't, didn't exist. And our goal and my team was like, we want to have a billion users. And when have people go like, that is the stupidest freaking thing I've ever heard. A billion? Yeah, a billion users. I mean, the internet's huge. Coverage is going to cover the entire planet. People would look at us like, you're out of your mind. Like, how many users does Facebook have now? Three and a half? Like, almost 50% of the world's on that platform between Instagram and Facebook. There. So I think if you think about resourcefulness, trying to put together teams, uh, Skunk Works teams is building stuff and then reinventing things that feel like they're, they've already been figured out and knowing there's another way to figure them out. I think that there's a ton to be learned 
from my career and careers like mine where folks challenge it. I think Airbnb is a great example of how things can change. Amazon, when you know, when Jeff started that thing in his garage and people are going like bookstore. You know, Jeff's idea wasn't a bookstore. It was to be the biggest merchant on the internet and turn the internet into the shopping lanes and shopping aisles of the future. And you know, look where we are now, just in terms of the value that's been announced. A way so, long answer. <laughs> Sorry. That it's an incredible story. It really is. Uh, we appreciate that. You were the chief product officer uh, at, at Yahoo. How did you get to that role? What were uh, some of your achievements, your challenges, notable changes in the culture that you may have uh, driven? And uh, was it fun? Was it uh, challenging? Was it stressful? Oh gosh, you know, I, I've, I've never, um, I haven't had a job, I think that I never conceptualized as being fun. It, well, they've all been fun. You know, I don't, it's one of those things that says, you know, if you're having fun in your role, you're, you're never going to feel like you work a day in your life, you know? And I look back at all the things I've done and they were just all just a blast. And I worked with great people throughout my career that was, you know, I'm a people person. I sometimes say I collect people and never let them go. Uh, and I've had people that I've kept from my first teams at Microsoft, into Yahoo, into GoDaddy. Uh, Yahoo was interesting. I, I started there in 2010 but I had done an interoperability deal with Yahoo uh, when we started, uh, when we had a critical mass with MSN Messenger. We initially went to Yahoo in 2007 and asked if they wanted to interoperate with this product we were gonna build that was an instant messaging product. They already had one, of course. And they said, no, you know, pound sand, we're not interested in that. Um, so we said, okay, we'll build it. So we built it and we ended up with around uh, a couple hundred million users, lots concurrently. And uh, Yahoo became quite interested uh, in us. And we thought the right thing to do for the industry was to share our internet protocol so we could create one big, basically telecommunications network uh, for free. And so we shared our typing uh, indicator uh, patent with them, shared our protocols. They shared protocols with us and we interoperated our, our two networks. In the course of doing that, I met a ton of Yahoo people. Uh, and really fell in love with uh, the culture of Yahoo at the time. It was really friendly and like, I love Microsoft, but Microsoft was super edgy and very, very aggressive. And Yahoo was more of a, you know, super chill, kind of everybody get in the hot tub and make a decision kind of culture. <laughs> and uh, I thought, man, somewhere in between these two things, there's gotta be a, a great culture. And so I met a guy named Jerry Yang in that process who was the, the founder of Yahoo. And when I uh, tendered my resignation at Microsoft in 2007, just to basically retire and take you know, a few years off, Jerry said, hey, come have dinner with Terry Semmel and I. And Terry was the CEO at the time, Jerry was the chairman. And I, I went and had dinner with him and they were talking to Microsoft about being acquired. Had a very nice conversation with him about you know, the pros and cons of being acquired, et cetera. And we just hit it off and, and I, I went and I, I left that meeting, left Microsoft, traveled around the world with my kids for a year, I homeschooled them, half that's awesome. Travel around the world for a year, great. Homeschooling, yeah, that's a great. Which I'm sure lots of people on this call are experiencing right now. Right. Uh, and so we, we um, did that. I taught at Pepperdine for a couple of years and was getting a little, um, I, I just didn't have the scale that I liked uh, while I was being a professor. Uh, and so, um, I sent a note out to Jerry saying, hey, what's, what's happening with you? I'm kind of thinking about throwing my hat back into an operating role. He said, hey, we have something interesting you might want to think about at Yahoo. And I went and I drove up to the Bay Area, had a conversation, a lunch with him. Um, they said they were looking for uh, somebody to run product for them. And what, what were my thoughts about Yahoo? And I kind of gave him some ideas and thoughts of I, I had about what they could be, what they should be. And um, then met with Carol Bartz and met with some of the leadership team. Uh, and by 2010, maybe three months time, I had taken the role of chief product officer. And, and Yahoo, Yahoo by that time had lost a lot of its luster, right? It had done a Microsoft search deal. It had lost search to Google. Microsoft was outspending them. They couldn't possibly do it. They were a content network effectively with some good communications with Yahoo Mail and Yahoo Messenger. But they had a, an amazing publishing platform that they used 
and they had an advertising platform for display ads that was really for the best in the in the planet. And so my goal was to try to take that uh, take that team uh, and build a publishing platform that would not just be for advertising, but would be for all content. And uh, with some really sharp people uh, in the team, and it always has other other sharp people that are much smarter than me uh, making these things happen. Uh, we basically started to build out a publishing platform. Uh, the culture at Yahoo had shifted pretty dramatically uh, at that time. You know, over the years from 2007, when people were trying to pay him 40 billion for the company, to 2010, when Google had just absolutely dominated, you know, and grown really fast in search, they'd sort of lost their way and they had lost their willingness to fight. Uh, and but there was still this weird entitlement, you know, kind of like, hey, we're Yahoo. Were one of the best known brands on the internet, but they weren't they weren't earning it anymore. You know, the parking lot wasn't full of cars at seven. And so I ended up when I went to Yahoo, I, I tried to instill a sense of fight, purpose, uh, and vision back into the product organization, which was around six thousand people, it was about half the company. Uh, and so we put together a. Um, uh, mantra around what the vision was going to be, what our goals was going to be. I got support from the CFO and uh, the CEO, Carol Bartz at the time. Uh, and we just started embarking on a sort of a cultural change that was going to be more gritty, more determined, still nice and still, you know, wonderful, but a little bit more regimented than hopping into a hot tub and making a decision. Uh, and so we we did as, as much as we could. Uh, the board got very, um, impatient with Carol in terms of uh, turning the company around. And she had promised some things in terms of revenue growth that weren't happening. Board got impatient, uh, they fired her right as I was bringing that publishing platform to fruition. So we ended up having to shut it, uh, basically shut it down. I left the company. In fact, you know, we hired a guy, Scott Thompson, who be, was a president of PayPal to be CEO. Uh, he came in, uh, really didn't like the publishing uh, or the, the advertising business at all, wanted to become a payments company, uh, which we didn't have any of the DNA for. Uh, Stray structured the company with uh, uh, VCG, with Boston Consulting Group, laid off a ton of people, hampered our ability to really build anything I thought that was significant. Uh, and I left, um, you know, left the company and went and hung out in, in the process. After Carol got fired, I ended up meeting with a whole bunch of folks that had interest in buying a portion, a stake of the company strategically. Um, Egon Durbin at Silver Lake, uh, Texas Partners Group uh, Partners, uh, Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz. And they all went through, um, you know, my strategy, my vision for the company. It was basically Jerry, me, uh, Tim Morse, who is our CFO, and Mike Callahan, our, Mike Callahan who was our chief counsel who were in these meetings trying to tell people this is the value that this company is going to create if uh, if you can invest in it over the course of the next you know five to ten years um ultimately they uh they didn't do that they didn't make an investment in the company they did recommend uh scott thompson for hire and that that did happen um i, I left the company scott was uh fired i think six weeks after i left for falsifying a resume as it turned out uh and Marissa came on, and uh, oddly enough, I ended up uh, just taking another long vacation, finishing the house that I'm uh, delivering this talk from uh, right now. And you know, I don't know. It was uh, it was a great experience, and it was really fun. But uh, you know, learned a lot and, and had a great experience. But I guess experience is what you get when you don't get what you want sometimes. And uh, that was one of those. So um, we met when uh, you became the CEO of GoDaddy. That was your last uh, operating role. And uh, yeah. how did you decide that that was a, a good fit for you? Oh, uh, man. So I, I, when it, I got called by a headhunter, and it was actually Mark Andreessen who had recommended me for the job and Egon Durbin um, from Silver Lake, because Silver Lake was one of the folks that bought uh, the company from Bob Parsons. They uh, uh, this totally unbeknownst to me, Silver Lake KKR and TCV, three venture capital slash private equity companies, uh, had bought GoDaddy for $2 billion. Um, and that was in 20, 
uh, 11. And the company had put in a, a CEO and had somebody in, in the role. Uh, it wasn't doing well. They were, they were not growing. They were having issues. Um, and the, 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 apparently the, the investors thought that they needed a product leader uh, to run the company. And I, I was a GoDaddy customer. The only thing I knew about GoDaddy was they were the biggest domains company in the world, and they did the most salacious advertising uh, you'd ever see. You know, the, the Super Bowl ads were infamous. And so I, I, I uh, got this, you know, the guy said, would you be interested? I'm going, yeah, not really. I know the company, and it's, I don't know why they'd want to have a guy like me who's just a tech guy. Well, you know, this is who bought them. They think there's a product job here. So if you have interest, I'll send you this deck. And they sent me a deck, you know, PowerPoint deck, basically, that showed a company that had almost a billion dollars in revenue. I mean, I was blown away to absolutely change my perspective of the company completely. They had uh, almost a billion dollars in revenue, 85% uh, customer retention, massive cash flow, 80% brand recognition in the United States had grown, you know, in, at double digits uh, for, you know, a de over a decade. And they did this uh, without ever leaving the United States. You know, they did it all as a U.S.-based company that couldn't take payment types from outside of the country, couldn't take uh, other currencies, what, what wasn't, weren't in any other languages. They had, they had grown this business, and like 15% of their business was, in, uh, was out of the country. So I'm like, wow, that's crazy. If you actually, if I did the same playbook I did at these other companies, at Microsoft, when we did uh, MSN Messenger and Hotmail, we, we took that out to 26 countries simultaneously and then grew it to 60. I said, if we could just grow, you know, change the platform, re-architect the platform, get a bunch of great engineers in this company and then build out uh, this thing so it has uh, international presence. I think this could be, you know, a company worth $5 billion. You know, how long will it take? I don't know. But so I, I got very excited. and. You know, interviewed with the interviewed with the board, uh, interviewed with uh, the founder Bob Parsons, uh, super interesting guy. You know, you know, you got you got to be interesting if you can grow almost a, a two you can grow a two billion dollar company as an LLC and never take a dime of venture. He did it all with his own money, bootstrapped the entire thing, and sold it for two billion. Super interesting guy. And then uh, and they hired me, and so I started immediately hiring. Uh, calling up friends and you know GoDaddy announced that I had joined and my inbox immediately filled with WTF mails. For those of you who know what the acronym means, uh, you'll know how surprised they were. They're like, dude, that is so off brand for you. Somebody who's been like, you know, tech and you've been a champion of women in technology and you've done all these things that don't seem like they're on the brand. And it gave me a chance to have that same aha moment with the, that I had with the people that were, you know, sending me WTF mail. So I was able to hire my chief architect, hire my chief scientist, hire my head of international, hire a ton of really great people from both Microsoft, Yahoo, and other tech companies, because they had no idea what this company could be, uh, could, could turn into. And they, they bought into it. And so we, we decided we were going to go on this path to go grow this thing. You know, and I made a, I signed a five-year contract. I served that five-year contract out. And by the time I, I left, we had, we had basically taken the company public, grown it to about 2.7 billion in revenue, grown it from 2 billion to 12 billion in valuation, uh, went into 60, 60 countries from one, uh, and had, uh, you know, I don't know, 8,000 employees up from around 3,000. And, you know, we're, it's a Phoenix-based company, as you know well, mm -hmm. Steve. Yeah. And, uh, all that growth came outside of the state. It was all California, Massachusetts, India, UK, um, Germany, et cetera. Well, you mentioned Bob Parsons. He's a uh, larger than life uh, person. He's uh, unconventional in almost uh, every way. You mentioned the advertising that, uh, you know, was, those were his ideas. Um, what was that like, work, you know, following in someone's footsteps like that? uh hardest part of the job you know he, he was he was larger than life uh in a, in a and and very unique they're like there there is no other bob parsons but when they made him they, they threw the mold away you know he was a marine uh credited his success with the marine corps and what he had learned there 
Um, I think he had built the company based on some of that uh, leadership style, which is very, you know, command oriented. You know, I, I say to do this and do this. Um, you know, tremendously successful, but, you know, in my experience, um, you know, that'll grow to a certain size. And then you actually have to empower leaders uh, to be thinking, uh, you know, thinking individuals that have the ability to execute themselves on ideas that they have and run. It was interesting. I remember I had a lunch with Bob. Uh, my interview was actually on a golf course. I'm a golfer and played at a course called Whisper Rock. And Bob and I just chatted about life. Yeah, super fun. Uh, great place. And Bob and I just chatted about life during the round. Such a super guy, funny, self effacing, honest. People were coming up to him and just saying, hey, Bob, what's going on? Bob was introducing me to people. I just just really fell in love with the guy. And uh, at lunch, we talked about how we think about things. And he told me the Super Bowl story about, you know, I know I know Super Bowl, why I did the ad was, I know the Super Bowl, the demographic is mostly guys. What are they? They're mostly drunk. What are mostly drunk guys what like to see? Women. So I did the Super Bowl ads that way. And then he talked about the product uh, that he, um, the product kind of strategy that he employed. He goes, I get an idea. If I like the idea, I do it. And if it's uh, if it's great, we keep doing it. If it, you know, if that dog hunts, we do it. And if it doesn't, we stop doing it. And I go, okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. That seems like a okay, good product on the market. He goes, well, so how do you think about that? I said, well, first of all, I I'd like to have like an overriding vision for the co company that's a bit larger than life. You know, something that's obtainable but really difficult to obtain. And then underneath that vision, we build. We build a mission and we build strategic containers for each thing that we think will drive that mission. So for us, it was, you know, building a, the best platform. It was being number one in domains industry. It was being a, a productivity business for small, for small and medium sized business. And our vision wasn't about domains or websites. It was about being the best platform for small businesses because that vision's big enough that allows you to go a ton of different places that you know, aren't just about domains or websites, they're about helping people become more productive, getting them into business. And GoDaddy's customer was somebody who has an idea, they go like, oh, I have an idea. Uh, I, wanna, I better go secure that idea. So I'm gonna go register the domain online so nobody can take it from me. That process is vastly easier than going to the trademark office in the United States or your country of choosing and trying to do it that way. So people secure their name. And then what do we have to do to let them take the next step? We do uh, a website, we do email, we do administration controls, we allow them to SEO their site, to do search engine marketing, we allow them to do email marketing. So enabling all these different businesses that, that they could be in that extended their capability. Um, very different. And to do that, those strategic containers, you have to have people that are in charge of each one of those things that own the decisions uh, inside those, I'll call them business units. And so I told Bob, you know, vision, mission, strategic containers, a five-year plan, you gotta have five years or you're, you end up chasing shiny objects if you don't have a super long five-year plan. You're gonna, re, you're gonna edit it, and you're gonna reiterate, uh, uh, iterate on it over the course of time, but you gotta have that thing stick. You're just gonna be chasing people. And he looked at me and he goes like, well, I don't know how you think, man, but I guess that's why. I'm <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was, I think, Wednesday or Thursday. And then Friday, uh, I got the job. It was announced. And then I, uh, that's when I got all the WTF mails. And I started about a month later after I spent a month, you know, just kind of firing up on the business, moving to Arizona and uh, hiring a bunch of people, just literally getting them. Uh, in love with the company so they could figure out what, how, how they wanted to be a part of it. Well, one of the things that you did at GoDaddy was really change the culture. And um, one of the things that happened is you really became uh, a champion for women. I've even written articles where I've talked about the cultural change that you've made there. And uh, why was that important to you? Uh, so my... my uh, First cultural change was absolutely required. When you have a, a leader that's as powerful as Bob and has grown up in the military, there's a command and control thing that happens that, that makes sense. 
Uh, as I said, you can't do that when you're trying to scale a business up and get empowered leaders. So I had to make a bunch of changes that were about having people that were thinking. And um, a couple of things I would do would challenge the old culture and you know, in front of people so people would feel comfortable challenging in themselves. And I, I would point something out that was broken. Everybody in the company was signing time cards. Uh, I remember second Friday in the office, the CFO you know, ran into my office and said, hey, you haven't signed the time cards. I'm like, what do you mean the time cards? He goes, well, you know, everybody has a time card. I'm going, why do you have a time card? He goes, well, you got it so you know I'm actually working. I'm going, Mike, how many, how many hours a week do you work? And he's like, I don't know, 60, 70, a lot, a lot of hours. I go like, well, what do you say on your time card? He goes, oh, 40. I said, well, why are you filling it out? He goes, well, you know, not everybody's trustworthy. So, you know, you've got to have people fill out time cards. I go, look, we're not going to be able to hire anybody from any company, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, eBay, PayPal. You just go down the list because none of those guys fill out time cards unless they're hourly employees. So we're not filling out time cards. And he says, if I, if I don't fill out time cards, if you don't fill out time cards, how am I going to get paid? Well, I'm like, well, you're the CFO. You'll figure it out. <laughs> and so I started telling stories like that to people in the company when they started talking about um, they started talking about the things that embarrassed them about their company or what they didn't like about the culture. They were very articulate about what they liked and they liked a lot. They liked the grittiness of it. They liked how hard they were. They liked the fact that, you know, they could solve any problem and it arose and a lot of problems arose because they didn't think long-term. So had to make a bunch of changes there. I know there was people didn't, uh, you know, you couldn't wear uh, flip-flops. You couldn't wear hats. There were a lot of things that were just kind of very buttoned up. And uh, so I would go through the customer care organization wearing baseball caps and flip-flops, you know, and saying hi to people and just being accessible and being, a, you know, just another person in the mosh pit trying to, you know, turn the company into a bigger company. Part of that, part of the things that, that people told me uh, was that they were embarrassed by the ads and they were embarrassed by people telling them that, they, they didn't know what GoDaddy was. They thought it was either you know a race car company or had something to do with porn. And it was like, well, that that does make sense. We're you know the, we're a technology company. We're we're big, and I and we're going to be a lot bigger. Uh, and then I had a converse, couple conversations with women who, and I did like a thousand you know group meetings, one on ones, hundreds of them, probably not a thousand. And I'd do them with women, and they'd say like, yeah, I was at you know a, a trade fair in Austin. Some guys came up and said, hey, are you a GoDaddy girl? It was like super embarrassing. Um, so it was really apparent that we had sort of painted ourselves into a corner, which, you know, if you're going to go international and you're going to grow a business that, and that already has 80% brand awareness through those, through those advertising. So to Bob's credit, Bob not done that. We wouldn't have had the, the brand awareness to matter a hill of beans, but we had a brand awareness that was so notable. And I, said, look, we're gonna change the culture from an advertising perspective. So when people see us, we're honoring women as small business people, not as objects. Like Danica Patrick, who was a race car driver and appeared in many ads as a very sexy woman, which she was, she's also an incredible achiever who won a IndyCar open wheel race and was doing NASCAR, which is you know gnarly. And so I had a conversation with her and said, hey, we're going to change your image and we're going to have you be, become a woman of achievement versus somebody who's just great looking. Uh, and we're going to start flipping the ads. So they talk about women as being, uh, you know, achievement. And, you know, most businesses, small businesses in the U.S. are run by women. And we should show those, those women as achievers who are fighting the good fight like everybody trying to keep their, their business going. Uh, and it was actually quite personal. My sister, who was a, a psychologist and a psychology professor at Washington State, um, was one of the foremost researchers in um, women's the, the effect of the media on women's self-esteem and the likelihood of that um, contributing to bulimia or anorexia. And my well, sister in her 30s was tragically um, uh, taken from us. She uh, died uh, very tragically and her daughter did as well. And my, my promise to her was that I would do everything in my career to forward the advancement of women. Um, 
that she did in hers. You know, I wouldn't you know, do things that were unnatural, but I'd do things that could have an impact. And so I, you know, flipped the way that the company was perceived outside uh, in. I helped start uh, a support, a women in tech uh, employee resource group in the company. It was run by Arana Wasti, who walked up and now runs Europe for GoDaddy and walked up and asked me if I would be willing to be the sponsor for this. And so I did, and I started meeting with great leaders like Tella Whitney of the Anita Borg Foundation, Maria Klawe of Harvey Mudd College, uh, Sabina Nawaz, who's a great personal coach, all these you know amazing women who, uh, who were sort of leading the charge of women in tech to tell them what we were going to do in the company. And then we re-architected the, uh, the company's HR documents and the way that we hired people, the way that we reviewed people, the way that we paid people to make sure that we were a great place uh, for women to work. So it wasn't just our advertisement. We were talking the talk and walking the walk inside the company so we could set an example. And I ended up actually keynoting two um, conferences uh, for, for the Grace Hopper Conference, talking about the steps that we had taken inside the company to ensure that women were paid uh, paid the same, that promotion frequency was happening at the same rate. Because you know, a woman, if she's 70% quali 75% qualified for a role, believes she's not quite ready. If a guy's 35% qualified for a role, he's ready right now. He's ready to go. And so we made some changes in our promotion philosophy to make sure that everybody got got reviewed for promotion in their first three years so we could start that process of getting people promoted. Uh, super important to me. So you really, um, through this process of enabling women, um, you also changed the perception about the company and you did that um, through your advertising strategy. Is that a yeah, you know, I think the, the I think the truth is it can't just be advertising strategy. And as we learned with Uber, uh, when Travis was running Uber and all the things that were going on inside the company, uh, you know, and Uber would talk about what they are externally, and the the, the employees were writing very very different things online about what was happening inside the company. You cannot have two separate brand truths about your company. You cannot portray your company one way in advertising and have it be something different inside the company. It has to be the same. So it, you had to do these things congruently. You had to do them at the exact same time. Um, so we, we did the advertising change. We shifted um, the internal focus to make sure that it was, you know, women were honored. It was really important uh, to me. And I actually, I had, I had quite a few conversations with execs in the company and with my board about whether that really mattered or not. And I thought, you know, nothing says that you're changing the company more than repositioning the way that you've um, managed the perception of women externally and internally and to be a force for good in that regard, I think really made a big difference. Um, certainly in hiring, because if you're not, you can't just advertise that way. If you're going to try to hire, uh, great engineers, many of which are women, you're not going to get them if, if you've got those two brand truths. So to actually double down on what we were doing internally, I think, you know, paid off. And I know when we left, 50% of our college engineering hires were women, which is, you know, unheard of for um, for any tech company. And I'd spend time on campuses with, with women's uh, computing groups. Now, talking to him about what we were doing and how we thought about it and my my history and my sister and what it meant to me personally. And I think all that really matters. That leads me to uh, another question with uh, what happened to George Floyd. There's a greater focus on um, racism, discrimination, diversity, inclusion. Um, can companies do the same thing around that? that, uh, for instance, you did for women at GoDaddy? Uh, yes, I think they can. I think it's, I think it's harder because, you know, 50%, more than 50% of the planet are women, right? So if I focus on uh, a, a, a group of people that is, you know, a huge part of the world, it's frankly easier than trying to solve the problem that are happening in, in, in companies, certainly in tech. In tech, 
underrepresented minorities are really, it's really tough, right? So you think about uh, African Americans, um, Hispanics, um, Native Americans in, in technology companies, they are horribly underrepresented across the board. And I think one of the issues, and I, this is something I, I brought up when I was at Microsoft, was most of these companies do a lot of their recruiting from places that actually have very bright people, but many of those people are economically advantaged. Uh, so if you think about, oh, I go to Harvard, I go to Stanford, I go to Berkeley, I go to places where, you know, there's a lot of really smart people. Well, it turns out that, you know, where folks may not be, will have economic challenges for going to universities like that. You can find incredibly bright people. You know, I, I'm a, if you think about state schools, I went to Cal State Northridge, I went to Cal State San Diego State, where I got my, uh, my undergrad degree. Like, at one point at, at Microsoft and the, the executive staff, which was 100, uh, 100 folks, the top 100 people in the company, two of them were San Diego State alums and, not, and there weren't any two that were Harvard at that time. So I think recruiting at schools and casting a broader net, because I, I hear school, I hear companies talk about pipeline issues. It's like, yeah, there are absolutely pipelining issues when you get down into high schools and we're not teaching the right subjects. We're not providing inner city schools with computers or computer science teachers, not creating that curiosity and solving those problems. But a pipeline problem also is with technology companies who don't recruit at the right schools right. and could do a much, much better job. I think, uh, I, I think that that's, uh, I think part of the problem. And I think that g genuinely, I think people hire people that are like them. And I think that's a biased problem that exists in technology and exists in all businesses. And I, I hope, my hope is that everything that's happened with Black Lives Matter raises people's awareness and actually has corporations that are be, being thoughtful about how they broaden their net and how they start I see it happening in a lot of numbers. Uh, a lot of the tech companies here in Arizona are really starting to focus. So um, you you focused a lot on uh, AI when you were at GoDaddy and even, even before. Uh, does AI contribute to uh, discrimination? Can it also help? Oh, uh, can it help? Yes. Does it contribute? Absolutely. Uh, there is an organization called the Alga, Algorithmic Justice, Justice League, AJL.org, uh, founded by a woman named Joy Bulamwini, uh, who actually is on the cover of Fast Company this month. Uh, and Joy was an intern of mine at Yahoo, brilliant woman who has discovered through her research and work that uh, algorithms will identify uh, women of color, men of color, way differently than they should and have amazing amounts of bias built into it. And you know, many of these algorithms are written by, uh, well, most of these algorithms are writ written by existing engineers. What do we know existing engineers are dominated by? Usually they're white or Asian males. Uh, and so there are some inherent issues in algorithms today that cause problems, cause problems in TSA lines, cause problems on police cams, uh, falsely identifying people, and those things have to be solved. And I think there's some efforts that are, that are doing it uh, that'll eventually help, uh, but right now it's not, uh, it's not helping. It's actually, I think, exacerbating some of the issues we have um, with both George, the George Floyd incident that caused the Black, Black Lives Matter movement to, to rise up and start, uh, I think, being heard. So, um, so I'm gonna ask you one last question, then I'm gonna try and figure out how to find the uh, audience questions here. Um, what advice do you have for um, the new generation of people or young people um, that are thinking about or entering the technology field? Uh, you know, I, it kind of goes beyond technology, uh, Steve. My, my, my advice uh, to, to people that are thinking about going into technology is, is do it because you're passionate about it. Do it because you found it to be the thing that is absolutely the most fun, energizing work yeah, you've ever done. And that doesn't mean you have to be a coder. You can be 
uh, a business person, you can be a marketer, you can be a human resources person, uh, you can be a salesperson. But being passionate about the way that technology can change people's lives um, is really important. And what I've I've given a couple of graduation ceremony speeches that is all about being who you are versus what you are. And I think that the world pay, plays pays a whole lot more attention to what somebody is versus who they are. You know, you'll hear about who somebody is at a funeral where people talk about compassion and empathy and they were funny, et cetera, uh, versus what they were, which is, you know, a, a, a CEO or a senior vice president or a uh, community activist or whatever. They, they, it's not about what, it's a, it's, it should be about who. And so what I would ask people that are in this, uh, in this webinar is to think about, to have an honest conversation with themselves about what gets them springing out of bed early in the morning and to pursue that. You know, if it's not technology, it's not technology. If it is, terrific. For me, it was. It was a huge deal. And, you know, for me, it was people and being able to work with really smart, super fun, engaging, curious people uh, really made a massive difference for me. So um, question from uh, an employee of uh, uh, GoDaddy. Looking back at your time at GoDaddy, what is something that you learned that you didn't expect in your time at GoDaddy? That's from uh, David Helgeson. Hi, David. Hey, David. So I think, you know, what I, what I learned, what I didn't expect to learn, which is really helpful, um, first was that culture is a, hard, is a thing that's hard to change. And, you know, you have to, uh, you have to live it every second uh, of it. And so you have to represent it day to day. It was absolutely exhausting to shift that culture and try to be a representation of, of, that, uh, of that culture every day. And, you know, honestly, at the end of five years, I was just totally burnt out, not just trying to shift the business to be much bigger and larger and international, but trying to, to make sure that folks knew I was very, very serious uh, about cultural change. It was living it every day. So my door was always open in my office. I had a bunch of things that I was passionate about. I had a drum kit in my office. I had a a balance board in my office. I had all kinds of things that represented me personally because I thought it was important for everybody to represent themselves and bring them their best selves to work. Um, you know, at the end, I think it's it's just re really tiring. That's number one. Number two was how to deal with a board. That was a big thing. You know, I, I dealt with you know CEOs and presidents. Uh, had had multiple board meetings with the Yahoo board and. The Microsoft board, but never reported to them. They were never my boss. And managing a, a board where you have, you know, basically eight bosses, all who have different ideas, one of whom is your founder, was uh, was a lot harder than a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, another question: Can we listen to any of your recorded music? Oh yeah, if, actually, if you go up on Spotify, uh, oh my, the stuff that I recorded myself. Oh no, none of that stuff's publicly available. But if you go up on YouTube, you can see me playing with a bunch of other artists where I'm playing their music. Um, Very cool. Uh, and then, yeah. And then if you just want to hear the, the stuff I listen to, and I was a jazz, jazz fusion guy uh, growing up, you can go up on Spotify and listen to playlists that I put together. So we've got about three minutes left. We've got lots of questions here, but um, the next one is uh, from Gwen Hellinger. Uh, if you could start a business today, what would you start? Oh boy, um, I would I would start a business that benefited from network effects. I think if it was going to be a SaaS based business, uh, if I was going to do something uh, from scratch, I think and I, I've actually told a couple parents this. I think I would focus on battery technology because I think. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that we're lacking right now is big improvements in battery technology. And we haven't seen the same kind of sea change in batteries that we've seen in things like memory. Uh, and, you know, the, the fact that a Tesla is only going, you know, 100 miles further than it was going a decade ago is pretty sad. And they're doing that just by, you know, using the same technology for the most part and being more efficient with it. So I think there's, I think there's a lot to be made there 
you know, I'm a, a, a car guy and batteries, I think, have a lot to do with cars, but I think they have a lot to do with power and managing your own grid and being off the grid. Uh, Uta Akoi asks, do you have any book recommendations? Uh, you know, I, I don't. Um, th there's some really old books that I think that are pretty uh, fascinating that I used when I was really young that I read. I mean, I have a bunch of novels that I like, but um, th this is a book that is totally undersold and it's, uh, it's How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> and as silly as that sounds, uh, you know, my son just went into business. Uh, he's, he just graduated from University of Washington, took his first job. You know, he's grown up with me and my wife and we're social and we love people and we're very comfortable uh, with them. And we know, we know those know the skills of bringing people out, which is mostly about listening, et cetera. And he's like, dad, it's amazing. Like everybody wants to work with me. And he's like, I, I, I don't know what it is. And it, it, honestly, I think it's because that how to win friends and influence people uh, is really a roadmap to how to how to treat people kindly uh, and be able to hear their point of view while they're hearing yours and become somebody who's better to work with. That was Dale Carnegie. Uh, that was Dale Carnegie. Yeah, and that thing's had more, that has had more pro probably positive effect on me. And I read it when I was a freshman in high school. So one final question, because we're almost at the hour. It's a really good one. What motivates you, keeps you focused, pressing forward through ambiguity, ambiguity and challenge? Uh, purpose. I think I think having a having a greater purpose uh, in life, and then having those strategic containers that I talked about um, really matter. And I think they they matter not just for your business. I think they matter in life. And it's not so much about deciding what you do, it's deciding what you don't do. And I have found that if you put these very, put a very broad capsule on what you want to do with your life or your business or your job or your career and say, I want to achieve this. And these are the things that I think I'm going to use to get there, um, which means these other things I'm just not going to do. Uh, I think that helps you stay focused. Now, I would also say that you know focus can also be the enemy of invention, and you have to while you're focused, you actually have to keep yourself permeable so other things, other areas can enter into your life, and it might allow you to say, "Wait a minute, I have been thinking about this all wrong." And so I think giving yourself a time whether it's yearly, whether it's every six months, quarterly, to reassess what your focus has been and what your values are, what your goals are. I think that is super, uh, super important to do. Um, and I, I think that'll keep you on track and allow you to get enough uh, new information to, and permeability to make good decisions as the world around us changes, which God knows that's been happening a ton. Yes. Blake, this has been uh, spectacular. Thank you for uh, sharing life lessons, uh, career uh, learnings that with the audience today. Thanks to Rutgers for uh, bringing this uh, program to us. And uh, always great to see you. Good to see you too, Steve. Thank, Thank you, you, Rutgers, both. very much. Yes. Thank you both so much. This was fantastic. Um, learned from both of you. And we had a fantastic audience participation um, with uh, make, you know, making our discussion very dynamic. Um, I wanted to just let everyone know that we also have a very exciting um, speaker coming up in our next Signature Leadership Series. As you can see, Anush Ansari was the first female private astronaut, and she's the CEO of XPRIZE, and she'll be up on our next one. Um, we hope our series continues to meet your needs. Um, we will be sending you a very brief survey as soon as this um, session ends. Um, when, I, when we began earlier, I mentioned that we were recording this session. It will be shared via social media um, on the Business Insights page of our website and emailed to people who registered. So everyone, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for having joined us, and we hope to see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.